we'll discuss some of our special senses more specifically. Starting with the types of receptors, moving on to the chemical senses of olfaction and gustation, and then vision, hearing, and equilibrium. Starting with the sensory receptors, there are many types of sensory receptors throughout the body. These receptors make it possible for our body to respond to the various stimuli encountered. In a general sense, we can consider these different receptors as a dendrite to sensory neurons. A stimulus to one of these receptors will elicit an action potential in a sensory or afferent neuron that will be brought to the brain for evaluation and if severe enough, immediately out of the spinal cord via motor efferent neurons to move the body part away from any damaging stimuli. Nociceptors are receptors that respond to tissue damage and the sensation of pain. Thermoreceptors detect changes in temperature, and there are different receptors for hot than there are for cold. Chemoreceptors detect specific chemicals. These could be oxygen or carbon dioxide levels in the blood various tastes from receptors on the surface of the tongue, or dissolved odor chemicals in the nasal passageway for smell. The main feature is that each molecule is detected by a specific receptor, and that there are many types of chemoreceptors throughout the body. Mechanoreceptors is a general term that covers many different types of receptors. The classification of mechanoreceptors has to do with the type of distortion or physical change to a receptor. These changes could be in the form of touch, pressure, stretch, vibration, etc. For mechanoreceptors, let's look at the different types. We have proprioceptors that tell us where our body is in space. Of these, we have Golgi tendon organs, muscle spindles, and joint sensors. These all are in the proprioceptor family, giving us information about our muscles and our joint, whether the tension on them or the angle of a joint. Moving on to tactile receptors that tell us about touch. We have a stronger force, which would be really deeply located receptors, or fine touch, which are located much more superficial. The stronger force receptors are called Raffini corpuscles or Pacinian corpuscles. The Raffini corpuscles respond to more of a distortion, like a twisting motion, where the Pacinian corpuscle is more of a, just a direct pressure, like squeezing. For fine touch, we either have just free nerve endings, which are often associated with pain, Merkel's discs, or Meissner's corpuscles. These last two are located right at the barrier between the superficial dermis and the bottom layer of the epidermis. Merkel cells are slow adapting in that they're going to still be responsive. You'll notice whatever light pressure is after a while, where Meissner's corpuscles, you'll feel something, but then you kind of forget about it. And you don't, so it's called fast adapting. Moving on to our last type of pressure sensor is a baroreceptor, and this detects pressure. We mostly will find these in arteries, so they detect arterial pressure. Proprioceptors tell us about where our body is in space and the forces our body faces. Muscle spindles protect us from rapid stretch, causing muscles to reflexively contract. Golgi tendon organs protect us from overexertion, causing muscles to reflexively relax. Receptors within joint capsules tell us about position. Within our skin are several types of receptors. The closer the epidermis, the more sensitive the sensation detected. Within the dermis are Pacinian corpuscles that detect the squeezing force, Raffini corpuscles that detect core torsion or a twisting force. Baroreceptors detect pressure and mostly found in arteries. So you should know the name and function of the different types of receptors, the classes of mechanoreceptors, the types of touch and pressure receptors, specific skin tactile receptors, and what they detect. What are proprioceptors and some examples, and what are baroreceptors and where they can be found? There are five special senses that we will go through. We'll begin with olfaction and gustation. Both olfaction and gustation are chemical senses in that they're triggered by physical contact with a molecule by chemoreceptors. These are both associated with the consumption of food as well as emotional responses. Our sense of smell is, of course, in our nose. 
Airborne molecules enter our nasal cavity to bind and ultimately dissolve in the mucus. The dissolved chemical can then be detected by the olfactory receptors that are hanging down in the nasal cavity like pendant lights. There are many different types of receptors to detect many more smells than we have for taste. The sensation of smell adapts very quickly so that you can quickly no longer notice an odor or its intensity is quickly reduced by your brain. When you have a cold, excessive mucus creates too great of a distance for the dissolved smell to reach the receptors, which is why you have trouble smelling when you have a stuffy nose. Inside the nasal cavity are the olfactory nerves with their receptors. Once triggered, the impulse travels up through the bony ceiling of the nasal cavity called the cribriform plate, which has many holes in it for these nerves. The olfactory bulb lives on the brain side of the cribriform plate and collect all the impulses from the olfactory nerves in the nasal cavity. From the olfactory bulb, the impulse travels along olfactory tracks to enter the medial portion of the temporal lobe. Smell is the most primal of our senses and the only one to bypass the thalamus by going directly to its destination in the cerebrum. The neural pathway from the olfactory nerves to the olfactory bulb in yellow, going to the olfactory tracts in pink, ultimately to the olfactory cortex in the temporal lobe. It is in this region that it will then connect with the limbic system along with our memory and emotion centers. Here's a summary slide for the neural pathway of smell. Gustation is the sense of taste. Our taste buds are really cells along the sides of the bumps on our tongue. The bumps on the surface of your tongue are called papilla, and we have a few different types as shown in the diagram. To taste something, it must dissolve and fall into the cracks between the papillae to bind to receptors for taste in the cells located there. The number of taste sensations are more limited than smell. In general, the tongue can be divided into different regions where certain taste receptors dominate, but this can vary from person to person. The neural pathway for taste uses three different cranial nerves. The anterior region is facial, the middle part is glossopharyngeal, and the part inside the throat goes via the vagus nerve. All these nerves bring the impulse to the medulla oblongata of the brainstem and then to the thalamus to ultimately end up at the tongue area of the primary somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe. Going from cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve, 9, glossopharyngeal, and 10, the vagus nerve, up to the medulla oblongata, the connection is ipsilateral, meaning that it stays on the same side of the body and doesn't cross over like other sensations entering the brain from the rest of the body. Then it goes up to the thalamus, which directs it out to the inferior region of the primary somatosensory cortex. You should know the process of olfaction and gustation. You should know the different taste sensations, and you should know the neural pathways for both. Now let's begin with vision. The eye is protected by the bones of the skull within the orbit and is maneuvered around by muscles. Accessory structures of the eye include the protective covering of the eye, known as the eyelid, properly known as the palpebra. A conjunctival sac includes a layer of small vessels that cover much of the surface of the eye. The lacrimal apparatus is our gland system that creates tears to wash away debris in our eyes and drain it into our nasal cavity. The extraocular muscles listed here move the eye to increase our field of vision. Under the eyelid is the conjunctiva. This is a thin mucous membrane that contains vessels that is continuous with the inner eyelid and the surface of the eye, but not covering the area light enters the eye so it won't obstruct our vision. The conjunctival fold will prevent a foreign object from entering the orbit around the eye. The lacrimal gland superior and lateral to the eye creates a fluid that washes medially across the eye to drain via the lacrimal sac into the nasolacrimal duct to exit via the nose. 
When you cry, you make an excessive amount that increases the fluid going into your nose, which is why you have to blow your nose when you cry. Plus, extra fluid can spill over and also run down your cheeks. Now let's go through the motions for the muscles of the eye. The arrows indicate the direction of movement for the four rectus muscles. The directions also correspond to their location, up for superior, down for inferior, medial for medial rectus, and out to the side for lateral rectus. The oblique muscles, however, have a direction of movement that is opposite to their location. The superior oblique controls a muscle that pulls on the eye from above, but the movement directs the pupil and our line of vision down and lateral. The inferior oblique will move the eye up and lateral. The eye is made of three distinct layers. The outermost layer is very strong, giving shape to our eye. The middle layer has several functions, including adjusting for light in our eye, creating fluid, and focusing our lens. The innermost layer is what detects the light and tells our brain what we see. The whites of our eyes is the sclera. The strong, fibrous outer layer is thick and provides shape to our eye. The most anterior portion of the eye where light enters and what we see through is clear. This area is the cornea. It has no blood vessels which could obstruct our view. The blood vessels as part of our conjunctiva can be seen on top of the white sclera but not covering the clear cornea. The vascular layer in the posterior portion of the eye is black. This dark layer absorbs light. With the exception of animals that can see well at night, this choroid layer is not black, but actually has a reflective surface, and it can be seen, for instance, in this raccoon when light is reflected back in a photo. The anterior portion of this vascular layer forms the ciliary body and the iris. The ciliary body has two functions. First, it has a muscular portion that pulls on suspensory ligaments attached to the lens to adjust our focus. Second, it has a secretory portion that creates a watery fluid called aqueous humor. This fluid enters the front part of the eye. The iris is the colored part of our eye. Muscles within the iris control the size of the pupil. It can open it, allowing more light to enter, or it can constrict and reduce the size of the pupil to minimize light into the eye. There are two main chambers to the eye. The anterior chamber in blue contains aqueous humor that is made by the ciliary body. The posterior chamber outlined in green contains a thick, clear, gelatinous light substance that helps to hold the retina in place. The anterior chamber's aqueous humor comes from the ciliary body. It moves up through the pupil to enter the anterior chamber. This fluid is drained away from the anterior chamber via a duct that circles the eye around the iris called the canal of Schlem. We only see it as two little circles because of the way the cut is on this diagram. In the posterior chamber in green, we have the thick gelatinous fluid called vitreous humor. This fluid is not replaced over time, but is constant throughout life. This vitreous humor can accumulate clusters of debris that people may notice as floaters across their line of vision. In summary, the anterior chamber has aqueous humor made by the ciliary body absorbed by the canal of Schlem. The posterior chamber has vitreous humor. It doesn't change throughout life. The iris is the colored part of the eye. When dilated, it causes the central hole, the pupil, to enlarge. This allows more light into the eye for sharper vision as needed during a flight or fight response. Iris constriction is a response to bright light and occurs under parasympathetic stimulation. The innermost layer of the three layers is called the retina. This is also known as the neural layer as it's made of nervous tissue. There are photoreceptors that respond to light and several neurons bringing the light stimulated information out to the optic nerve. There are two types of photoreceptors, rods, which detect black, 
to white in a grayscale continuum, and cones which detect colors. Rods are located all throughout the retina, but more so around the sides and less in the center back where your direct vision takes place. Cones are in their highest concentration in the direct vision areas at the very back center of the eye in line with the light coming in through the pupil. The center area is called the macula lutea with the center of that, like a bullseye if you will, is the fovea centralis. Cones not only detect color, but also provides you with the sharp clarity of your vision, while rods are more for peripheral vision that's a little more fuzzy. The direction that the rods and cones aim is actually away from the light towards the black choroid. Light enters the eye, hits the back wall on the choroid, then bounces back and stimulates the rods and cones. You can see an actual histology slide of the retina in the image above right and a corresponding diagram below. This image is the back of an eye as an ophthalmologist would view it. The dark area in the very center is the macula lutea where our cones are more concentrated. To the right in the light circle with vessels entering and exiting, this is our optic disc which does not have any photoreceptors, thus it's also called the blind spot. In this expanded sagittal view of the eye, we can see the retina choroid relationship in the magnification bubble. Also, you can see the blind spot or optic disc where the axons from the retina form the optic nerve. Two common problems with the eye are glaucoma and macular degeneration. Glaucoma is the result of excessive pressure in the anterior chamber. Often, a slower aqueous humor removal via the canal of Schlem. The result is a loss of peripheral vision. Macular degeneration is a loss of neural function at the macula lutea, which is the center of your vision. Thus, the patient with this condition loses sight of what they are looking directly at, but have preserved their peripheral vision. This relies more on rods and some peripheral cones, reducing the sharpness and of focus and color. The visual neural pathway will go via cranial nerve number two, the optic nerve. It reaches the X, which is the optic chiasm. Here, the nerve fibers from each eye split to go to both hemispheres via the optic tracts in pink. Optic nerves have information from just one eye. Optic tracts have information from both eyes. This image shows the portions of what you see with each eye and where they end up in the occipital lobe's primary visual cortex. Again, the neural pathway is optic nerve from the eye to the optic chiasm, to the optic tracts, to the thalamus, which directs it back to the primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe. This image shows the posterior portion of a dissected cow eye. The retina is wrinkled in appearance as a result of the removal of vitreous humor and cutting. This texture is similar to a wet tissue. It lies upon the choroid and tepidum lucidum in this case where it's a shiny turquoise color. Notice the area where this retina converges. This is the optic disc. You could even see some vessels coming from it. More images of a dissected cow eye. The posterior view of the anterior portion the ciliary body and pupil can be seen here. The lens is all chopped up. There's a big blob of vitreous humor. The posterior portion with the black portion of the choroid and the shiny part called the tepidum lucidum and the retina is just pushed over to the side. You should know for the eye the various accessory structures of the eye. You should know the different components and functions or actions of the vascular tunic. You should know the internal chambers of the eye and what is in them. You should know about the aqueous humor, what forms it and what removes it and where it goes. You should know the components of the retina and where the optic nerves exit the eye. And you should understand the differences between rods and cones in what they detect and where they can be found. For hearing and equilibrium, in this segment, we'll go over how we receive and process sound waves and motion. The ear has three regions, outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. 
The outer ear we can see on the sides of our head is known as the auricle or pinna. Its job is to direct sound waves into the tunnel called the external acoustic meatus. And the end of the outer ear is the eardrum called the tympanic membrane. This membrane is seen here and it's a very, very thin and it's only one centimeter in diameter. This is a view through an otoscope and you can see the bones of the middle ear just behind it since it's almost see-through. The middle ear is on the other side of the tympanic membrane. It contains our body's three tiniest bones called the ossicles. The malleus is shaped like a hammer or mallet and has one part against the tympanic membrane and the other against the next bone, the incus. Incus means anvil, like the one in the blacksmith days or the ones that many horseshoers use. The incus is touching the malleus and the last ossicle, the stapes. The stapes is shaped like a stirrup from an English saddle. The flat end of the stapes pushes against a membrane window that is the end of the middle ear and the start of the inner ear. The job of the ossicles is to function like a lever system that increases the motion started by the vibrations on the tympanic membrane. Ossicles amplify sound waves. If a sound is too loud, however, we have our body's tiniest muscles to tense up and prevent them from moving to reduce the sound waves to prevent any damage. The eustachian tube is more and more being called the pharyngotympanic tube. This alleviates pressure on the back of the tympanic membrane if you change in elevation. It's a tunnel from the middle ear to the pharynx or the back of your throat. In the upper image, the balance on either side of the tympanic membrane is equal. In the lower image, the outer pressure is high and the middle ear pressure is low. This would cause a tympanic membrane to bend and push inward. This can be very painful and if the pressure is not equilibrated quickly, can cause a tympanic membrane to rupture. This can happen when someone is in the descent phase of an airplane and their eustachian tube is blocked by mucus if they have a cold. We can see a healthy tympanic membrane on the left and a ruptured one on the right. Here is a close-up view of the three auditory ossicles the malleus, incus, and stapes. The malleus receives vibrations from the tympanic membrane and transmit it to the incus, which transfers it to the stapes, which pushes in and out like a plunger on the oval window. This is how sound waves turn into mechanical vibrations that will ultimately enter the inner ear to be turned into a nerve impulse for the brain. The inner ear is comprised of tunnels within the temporal bone. One region with the three circles is for balance, while the other region that's like a snail shell is for hearing. The cochlea, the snail shell, receives the sound waves from the stapes pushing on the oval window. The semicircular canals, which are the three loops, and the vestibules, that'll send signals to the brain based on body movements or tilt for your equilibrium. The cochlea is for hearing, and it's literally tunneled into the bone. This is a skull with a portion of the bone removed so you can see a portion of the cochlea burrowed into the bone. The bony labyrinth are tunnels in the bone. The membranous labyrinth are the soft tissues filled with fluid that move receptors to stimulate nerves going to the brain. For sound, the stapes pushes on the oval window, creating wave-like surges into the cochlea. As the oval window pushes in, the round window at the other end of the membranous labyrinth pushes out. This cartoon image of the cochlea shows the snail shell partly unrolled. Inside, we see the oval window adjacent to the stapes and the round window at the exit point. Along the middle is a dark pink membrane called the organ of Corti. This has tiny hairs standing up from it. When a sound wave enters via the oval window pushing on the fluid inside the cochlea, it will cause these hairs to bend depending on the pitch of the sound. This hair movement on the organ of Corti is what stimulates the nerve to our brain to let us know what we've heard. 
Now let's look at a cross section of the cochlea. We can see there are three chambers within the organ of Corti in the middle. For our class, I just want you to know that the organ of Corti is where the hair cells are that bend to a particular pitch. A high pitch sound stimulates the region closest to the round window, while progressively lower sounds stimulate the hairs farther out along the organ of Corti with the deepest, lowest sounds at the very end. The progression of sounds is similar to the sequence of keys along a piano. When talking about sound, there are two variables, pitch and volume. Pitch is the note or sound itself, whether it's high or low. The frequency, amount of cycles per second, determines the pitch. High sound, high pitch, has many cycles per second. In this example, we can see that the green waveforms is at a greater frequency than the red. The green waveforms will be a lot higher pitch where the red waveform represents a low, deep sound. Volume is determined by how tall the waves are, so the blue one in the middle will actually be the loudest, where the red and the green are going to be of actual similar volume. In the graph on the left, you would hear the same sound because the frequencies are the same. However, the top one is quieter and the bottom one's louder. Because of the amplitude, or how tall the wave is, that tells you how loud it is. On the graph on the right, the volume is the same between both images, but the top one would be a low note, where the bottom one would be a high note. The hair cells on the organ of Corti move. High pitch sounds stimulate cells near the oval window. Low pitch sounds stimulate hair cells farther out toward the end of the cochlea. Sound waves are directed into the external auditory canal by the pinna. The tympanic membrane vibrates to a particular sound that it receives. Ossicles increase the movement received by the tympanic membrane to push on the oval window. Sound is detected by the hair cells on the organ of Corti within the cochlea. Neurons from the cochlear nerve are stimulated and directed to the brain. The neural pathway for sound begins at the stimulation of the cochlear nerve by the organ of Corti going to the medulla oblongata with some fibers going to the midbrain of the inferior colliculus to help you turn your head to hear the sound better, and the other fibers going to the thalamus to be directed to the primary auditory cortex, then to the auditory association area for interpretation. From cranial nerve 8, the vestibulocochlear nerve travels to the medulla oblongata. Here, some cross over and some remain ipsilateral or on the same side. Then it goes to the midbrain's inferior colliculus, then on to the thalamus, and then ultimately out to the temporal lobe's primary auditory cortex. The other role of the inner ear is equilibrium and balance. The vestibular apparatus for equilibrium and balance is divided to two sections. The semicircular canals detect rotational movement, and the vestibule to detect tilt, direction of lean, or acceleration and deceleration. The semicircular canals are responsible for rotation movement of our dynamic equilibrium. These circles are filled with fluid. When we spin in a particular direction, the fluid rotates in the canal along the plane of movement. There are three circles and each one is oriented in a different direction. Anterior is for front rolling movements like a somersault. Posterior one is for side movements like a cartwheel. Lateral is for horizontal movements like a ballerina spin. At the base of each of these circles is a sensor called an ampulla, which is bent when the fluid in that circle is under motion from a movement. The effect of this motion is like stirring your coffee. Once you impart the momentum from the spoon, the fluid will continue to move around the cup even after you've removed the spoon. This is why when you spin, you feel the motion even after you've stopped. We can see the three different rotational movements that would stimulate each of the semicircular canals and their ampulla inside.
In the vestibule region, there are two receptors, the utricle and the saccule. These detect linear motion or tilt. Leaning one side or the other would stimulate the utricle and saccule. Linear motion, like accelerating or decelerating in a car, would also stimulate the utricle and saccule. You should know the parts of the external ear up to the tympanic membrane. On the other side, you should know the features within the middle ear and the function of the ossicles. You should know the inner ear portion, the role of the vestibule and semicircular canals and their specific receptors, the ampulla, utricle, and saccule. You should know about sound waves, what the frequency, pitch, amplitude, and volume. You should know about the role of the cochlea and how sound waves travel within, and you should know the neural pathway of sound.